Christianity and Islam in Spain, A.D. 756-1031, to by Charles Reginald Haynes. Chapter 1, The Goths in Spain Just about the time when the Romans withdrew from Britain, leaving so many of their possessions behind them, the Suve, Alani, and Vandals, at the invitation of Gerontius, the Roman governor of Spain, burst into that province over the unguarded passes of the Pyrenees. Close on their steps followed the Visigoths, whose king, taking in marriage Placidia, the sister of Honorius, was acknowledged by the helpless emperor, independent ruler of such parts of southern Gaul and Spain as he could conquer and keep for himself. The effeminate and luxurious provincials offered practically no resistance to the fierce Teutons. No Arthur arose among them, as among the warlike Britons of our own island. No Veriathus, even, as in the struggle for independence against the Roman Commonwealth. Mariana, the Spanish historian, asserts that they preferred the rule of the barbarians. However this may be, the various tribes that invaded the country, found no serious opposition among the Spaniards. The only fighting was between themselves, for the spoil. Many years of warfare were necessary to decide this important question of supremacy. Fortunately for Spain, the Vandals, who seemed to have been the fiercest horde and under the ablest leader, rapidly forced their way southward, and passing on to fresh conquests, crossed the Straits of Gibraltar in 429. Not, however, before they had utterly overthrown their rivals, the Suvi on the river Beitis, and had left an abiding record of their brief stay in the name of Andalusia. For a time, it seemed likely that the Suve, in spite of their late crushing defeat, would subject to themselves the whole of Spain. But under Theodoric II and Yurik, the Visigoths finally asserted their superiority. Under the latter king, the Gothic domination in Spain may be said to have begun about ten years before the fall of the Western Empire. But the Goths were as yet by no means in possession of the whole of Spain. A large part of the south was held by imperialist troops, for, though the Western Empire had been extinguished in 476, the Eastern Emperor has succeeded by inheritance to all the outlying provinces, which had even nominally belonged to his rival in the west. Among these was some portion of Spain. It was not till 570, the year in which Muhammad was born, that a king came to the Gothic throne strong enough to crush the Suve and to reduce the imperialist garrisons in the south. And it was not till 622, the very year of the flight from Mecca, that a Gothic king, Swintilla, finally drove out all the emperor's troops and became king in reality of all Spain. Scarcely had this been well done when we perceived the first indications of the advent of a far more terrible foe, the rumors of whose irresistible prowess had marched before them. The dread which the Arabs aroused, even in distant Spain as early as a century after the birth of Muhammad, may be appreciated from the despairing lines of Julian, Bishop of Toledo. Woe is me! Africa is full of warlike men who come to conquer nations, an unspeakable insult to our country. Before giving an account of the Saracen invasion and its results, it will be well to
to take a brief retrospect of the condition of Christianity in Spain under the Gothic domination and previous to the advent of the Muslims. There can be no doubt that Christianity was brought very early into Spain by the preaching, as is supposed, of St. Paul himself, who is said to have made a missionary journey through Andalusia, Valencia, and Aragon. On the other hand, there are no grounds whatever for supposing that James, the brother of John, ever set foot in Spain. The invention of his remains at Iraflavia in the 9th century, together with the story framed to account for their presence in a remote corner of Spain, so far from the scene of the Apostles' martyrdom, is a fable too childish to need refutation. The honor of first hearing the gospel message has been claimed, but it seems against probability for Illibiris. However that may be, the early establishment of Christianity in Spain is attested by Irenaeus, who appeals to the Spanish church as retaining the primitive doctrine. The long roll of Spanish martyrs begins in the persecution of Domitian, 95 AD, with the name of Eugenius, Bishop of Toledo. In most of the succeeding persecutions, Spain furnished her full quota of martyrs, but she suffered most under Diocletian in 303. It was in this emperor's reign that nearly all the inhabitants of Caesar Augusta were treacherously slaughtered on the sole ground of their being Christians, thus earning for their native city from the Christian poet Prudentius the proud title of Patria Sanctorum Martyrum. The persecution of Diocletian, though the fiercest, was at the same time the last, which afflicted the church under the Roman Empire. Diocletian, indeed, proclaimed that he had blotted out the very name of Christian and abolished their hateful superstition. This, even to the Romans, must have seemed an empty boast, and the result of Diocletian's efforts only proved the truth of the old maxim, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. The Spanish Christians about this time held the first ecclesiastical council whose acts have come down to us. This council of Illibris, or Elvira, was composed of 19 bishops and 36 presbyters who passed 80 canons. The imperial edict of toleration was issued in 313, and in 325 was held the first general council of the church under the presidency of the emperor, Constantine, himself an avowed Christian. Within a quarter of a century of the time, when Diocletian had boasted that he had extirpated the Christian name, it has been computed that nearly one half of the inhabitants of his empire were Christians. The toleration, so long clamored for, so lately conceded, was in 341, put an end to by the Christians themselves, and pagan sacrifices were prohibited. So inconsistent is the conduct of a church militant and a church triumphant. In 388, after a brief eclipse under Julian, Christianity was formally declared by the Senate to be the established religion of the Roman Empire. But the security, or rather predominance, thus suddenly acquired by the church, resting as it did in part upon royal favor and court intrigue, did not tend to the spiritual advancement of Christianity. Almost coincident with the Edict of Milan was the appearance of Arianism, which, after dividing the church against itself for upwards of half a century, 
and almost succeeding at one time in imposing itself on the whole church. Finally, under the missionary zeal of Ulphilus, found a new life among the barbarian nations that were pressing in upon all the northern boundaries of the empire, ready, like eagles, to swoop down and feast upon her mighty carcass. Most of these barbaric hordes, like the Goths and Vandals, adopted the semi-Aryan Christianity first preached to them by Ulphilus toward the close of the 4th century. Consequently, the nations that forced their way into southern Gaul and over the Pyrenees into Spain were nominally at least Christians of the Aryan persuasion. The extreme importance to Spain of the fact of their being Christians at all will be readily apprehended by contrasting the fate of the Spanish provincials with that which befell the Christian and Romanized Britons at the hands of our own Saxon forefathers only half a century later. Meanwhile, the church in Spain, like the church elsewhere, freed from the quickening and purifying influences of persecution, had lost much of its ancient fervor. Gladiatorial shows and lascivious dances on the stage began to be tolerated even by Christians, though they were denounced by the more devout as incompatible with the profession of the Christian faith. Spain also furnishes us with the first melancholy spectacle of Christian blood shed by Christian hands. Priscillian, Bishop of Avila, was led into error by his intercourse with an Egyptian Gnostic. What his error exactly was is not very clear, but it seems to have comprised some of the erroneous doctrines attributed to Manes and Sibelius. In 380, the new heresy with which two other bishops besides Priscillian became infected was condemned at a council held at Saragossa and by another held five years later at Bordeaux. Priscillian himself and six other persons were executed with tortures at the instigation of Ithacus, bishop of Sasuba, and Idacius, bishop of Meridia, in spite of the protests of Martin of Tours and others. The heresy itself, however, was not thus stamped out and continued in Spain until long after the Gothic conquest. There is some reason for supposing that at the time of the Gothic invasion, Spain was still in great part pagan, and that it continued to be so during the whole period of Gothic domination. Some pagans undoubtedly lingered on, even as late as the end of the 6th century, but that there were any large numbers of them as late as the 8th century is improbable. Dr. Dunham, who has given a clear and concise account of the Gothic government in Spain, calls it the most accursed that ever existed in Europe. This is too sweeping a statement, though it must be allowed that the haughty exclusiveness of the Gothic nobles rendered their yoke peculiarly galling while the position of their slaves was wretched beyond all example. However, it is not to their civil administration that we wish now to draw attention, but rather to the relations of church and state under a Gothic administration, which was at first Arian and subsequently Orthodox. The government, which began with being of a thoroughly military character, gradually tended to become a theocracy, a result due in great measure to the institution of national councils, which were called by the king and attended by all the chief ecclesiastics of the realm. Many of the nobles and high dignitaries of the state also took part in these assemblies, though they might not vote on purely ecclesiastical matters 
These councils, of which there were nineteen in all, seventeen held at Toledo, the Gothic capital, and two elsewhere, gradually assumed the power of ratifying the election of the king and of dictating his religious policy. Thus, by the Sixth Council of Toledo, Canon three, it was enacted that all kings should swear not to suffer the exercise of any other religion than the Catholic, and to vigorously enforce the law against all dissentients, especially against that accursed people, the Jews. The fact of the monarchy becoming elective, no doubt, contributed a good deal to throwing the power into the hands of the clergy. Dr. Dunham remarks that these councils tended to make the bishops subservient to the court, but surely the evidence points the other way. On the whole, it was the king that lost power, though no doubt, as a compensation, he gained somewhat more authority over church matters. He could, for instance, issue temporary regulations with regard to church discipline. Witiza, one of the last Gothic kings, seems even to have authorized, or at least encouraged, the marriage of his clergy. The king could preside in cases of appeal in purely ecclesiastical affairs, and we know that Ricard the first, five eighty seven to six o one, and Sizebert six twelve to six twenty one, did in fact exercise this right. He also gained the power of nominating and translating bishops, but it is not clear when this privilege was first conceded to the king. The Fourth Council of Toledo, 633, enacted that a bishop should be elected by the clergy and people of his city, and that his election should be approved by the metropolitan and synod of his province. While the Twelfth Council, held 48 years later, evidently recognizes the validity of their appointment by royal warrant alone. Some have referred this innovation back to the despotic rule of Theodoric the Ostrogoth at the beginning of the 6th century. Others to the sudden accumulation of vacant sees on the fall of Arianism in Spain. Another important power possessed by the kings was that of convoking these national councils and confirming their acts. The sudden surrender of their Arianism by the Gothic king and nobles is a noticeable phenomenon. All the barbarian races that invaded Spain at the beginning of the 5th century were inoculated with the Arian heresy. Of these, the Vandals carried their Arianism, which proved to be of a very persecuting type, into Africa. The Suve, into which nation the Alani, under the pressure of a common enemy, had soon been absorbed, gave up their Arianism for Orthodox faith about 560. The Visigoths, however, remained Arians, until a somewhat later period, until 589, namely, when Ricard I, the son of Leo Vigild, held a national council and solemnly abjured the creed of his forefathers, his example being followed by many of his nobles and bishops. The Visigoths, while they remained Arian, were on the whole remarkably tolerant towards both Jews and Catholics, though we have instances to the contrary in the cases of Uric and Leo the Guild, who are said to have persecuted the Orthodox party. The latter king, indeed, who was naturally of a mild and forgiving temper, was forced into harsh measures by the unfilial and traitorous conduct of his son, Ermenegild, if the latter had been content to avow his conversion to orthodoxy without entering into a treasonable rebellion in concert with the Suve 
and imperialists against his too indulgent father, there is every reason to think that Leo Vigild would have taken no measures against him. Even after a second rebellion, the king offered to spare his son's life, which was forfeit to the state, on condition that he renounced his newly adopted creed and returned to the Aryan fold. His reason, a very intelligible one, no doubt, was that he might put an end to the risk of a third rebellion by separating his son effectually from the intriguing party of Catholics. To call Ermenegild a martyr, because he was put to death under such circumstances, is surely an abuse of words. With the fall of Arianism came a large accession of bigotry to the Spanish church, as is sufficiently shown by the canon above, quoted from the Sixth Council of Toledo. A subsequent law was even passed, forbidding anyone under pain of confiscation of his property and perpetual imprisonment to call in question the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, the evangelical institutions, the definitions of the fathers, the decrees of the church, and the sacraments. In the spirit of these enactments, severe measures were taken against the Jews, of whom there were great numbers in Spain. Seisbert, 612 to 621, seems to have been the first systematic persecutor whose zeal, as even Isidore confesses, was not according to knowledge. A cruel choice was given the Jews between baptism on the one hand and scourging and destitution on the other. When this proved unavailing, more stringent edicts were enforced against them. Those who, under the pressure of persecution, consented to be baptized, were forced to swear by the most solemn of oaths that they had in very truth renounced their Jewish faith and abhorred its rites. Those who still refused to conform were subjected to every indignity and outrage. They were obliged to have Christian servants and to observe Sunday and Easter. They were denied the Ias Canumbi and the Ias Honorum. Their testimony was invalid in law courts unless a Christian vouched for their character. Some who still held out were even driven into exile, but this punishment could not have been systematically carried out, for the Saracen invasion found great numbers of Jews still in Spain. Naturally enough, under these circumstances, the Jews of Spain turned their eyes to their co-religionists in Africa. But, the secret negotiations between them being discovered, the persecution blazed out afresh, and the 17th Council of Toledo decreed that relapsed Jews should be sold as slaves, that their children should be forcibly taken from them, and that they should not be allowed to marry amongst themselves. These odious decrees against the Jews must be attributed to the dominant influence of the clergy, who requited the help they thus received from the secular arm by wielding the powers of anathema and excommunication against the political enemies of the king. Moreover, the cordial relations which subsisted between the church and the state, animated as they were by a strong spirit of independence, enabled the Spanish kings to resist the dangerous encroachments of the papal power, a subject which has been more fully treated in an appendix.